Greetings, family. Um, we are part of the African diaspora that has been uprooted and transplanted and has been reborn here within the Caribbean. Hello, and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewan Fo, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now, let's get started with this episode. Through the recognition of identity connections to Mama Africa. My name is Ongfra Wells. I am a priest within the spiritual Baptist faith. I am also a cultural um, ambassador within my music, um, Ongfra and Lion Family Soul Theirs. We are working in the genre of reggae and soca and gospel. We are working in any genre, but those are the predominant ones that we try to get across our conscious message. Um, we think that uh, the world today needs light. The world today needs some kind of healing. It needs joy. So we want to combine those things to bring about that kind of uh, reflection as we move forward to reclaiming our humanity. So bless up to our brother Obehi for giving us this opportunity to be on this podcast this morning. Family, hello! Greetings. <laughs> That's lovely. There is a lot of energy here. This is powerful. <laughs> blessings, blessings, my brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. All right. So here in the diaspora, like you already pointed out, uh, we're very proud of where we are coming from, our roots. Of course, we need yes. to continue to talk about it. We are never going to be tired of that. Uh, so for that, I'm going to be intentional in trying to ask you where you were born, where you grew up. That is particularly important for us. I was born from the creation of time and given a human body placed within Trinidad, connected to my African ancestry. Um, Trinidad is in the Caribbean, so we have Trinidad, Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados, St. Vincent, Grenada, those islands within the Caribbean. And here we are working out our salvation according to the, to the historical dictates of our times. Because obviously, if one functions outside of one's historical responsibility, you become irrelevant or you become a impediment towards the people actualizing their, their full potential and their humanity. So, like we say, blessed joy to, to be able to plant seeds, you know, that those seeds will be respected by those who went before us, those who are within our time, and those who are yet to come to this earth. So, again, born in Trinidad, living here now in Barbados, um, doing my work doing my work according to historical realities all right thank you for that uh can you take us a little back in time when you were still uh, a young boy that is important also help us to understand what you see around you uh in trinidad and tobago well that is an interesting journey my brother um coming all the way from africa land Coming to carry us home. Coming all the way from Africa land. Coming to carry us home. And I sing that song because as a young man growing up, and the, the, the brothers and sisters will bring around the drums and we will start chanting, start reclaiming the identity. From the 1970, Trinidad had a cultural, social, political revolution, spiritual revolution where we consciously continued the struggle, but it was more impactful about decolonization. And it was from that time, excuse me, where you had more acceptance of the African um, roots that lived through colonialism and was still present within the society. So by and large, the young people and the general masses started to reclaim that 
African sense of identity and culture was always the main vehicle in bringing that information and that transformation to the fore. So I sing that song because that song was one of the cornerstones within our church and also within our social everyday lives. So those are the, the true genuine aspects of culture where you can see or acknowledge eh, wherever there is oppression, obey, there will be resistance. And resistance will take these forms regardless if it is within the church or in the social movement. So that is the journey of most of our um, realization and transformation as a people. At some point in time in every country, regardless if it's within the Caribbean or in Latin America, that is going on now, there must be a realization that we are African people living outside of Africa, but it does not subtract from our identity and our claim to, towards that, that, that root that from, was there from the foundation of time. So that is part of the journey. And that, I say that 1970 revolution in Trinidad has made me who I am today in terms of uh, historical context. Yeah, I would say so. Thank you for that. It is very important. Yeah. So, uh, when you were still growing up now, uh, still in Trinidad and Tobago, um, when you look around the people, uh, other people like you in the community, what was the thing that actually tied the people together? Uh, okay, there is a revolution now. Okay, in the time of revolution, people, we, we don't question unity, we don't question identity, because that is why there is a revolution anyway, because without that, there is no revolution, no? So I want you to tell me the bond that existed really uh, in Trinidad and Tobago and among the African diaspora, if we were to extend it in that sense. Well, the, 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 90, the 1970 revolution, um, it, it was the, the, the catalyst for, for all things being reborn within my time. And I am saying that because not that there were, there were not other soldiers who made contribution from colonialism to independence, to setting up um, pol political parties. But the, the, the 19th century revolution, it, it cemented the Africanness within as to who we are, um, it gave it gave a confrontation as to what are the specific element that was retained from the colonial era that needs to be disbanded. Um, We've seen recently with the Black Lives Matter, with the taking down of statues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement globally is a continuation of the same African people reclaiming the integrity of our African selves. And so is the same thing that happened in Trinidad um, in terms of identifying, because you have to remember the country was out colonialism. In, we received independence in the 60s, but in the 70s, the dismantling of colonialism was still a very much um, task at hand. So the banking institutions, the foreign investments, the, the churches in terms of uh, white superiority within the churches, you know, with um, Jesus, Mary, everybody in the churches, white but the only person you will find in the churches is the devil who was painted black. So it's breaking down that kind of socialization and inferiority complex. All those things came to the fore and identified that these are the things that has to be disbanded. So that, is, was, that was the struggle and, and it produced, and it still is producing uh, resistance. I don't know if you know that within Trinidad, Trinidad, the... Um, they started 
the global recognition of the 1st of August to be an international holiday, especially within the Caribbean, because the 1st of August was Emancipation Day. And we have to give credit to those visionaries that today, if you do go to Trinidad for Emancipation Day, it is a national celebration. People from the four corners of the country see literally a sea of beautiful African people dressed in their attire, singing songs and working out the methodologies for their liberation through culture. So um, I can only advise you, if you cannot go, look on the uh, YouTubes for Emancipation Day in Trinidad and see how that has blossomed. Trinidad, Barbados, Guyana, it has moved out to Trinidad to other countries. And uh, I think it has also affected as far as Africa, Emancipation Day, the 1st of August. So that is one of the tangible contributions in terms of the decolonization and the reclaiming of self. Of course, later we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between the diaspora and also Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I am mm, looking at the, the diaspora community now, uh, looking in particular case, uh, maybe the Caribbean, uh, looking at a man like uh, Marcos Gave and how he was able to organize the people, of course, before the 70 now. Um, I want you to tell me, that figure, that personality, that human being, what kind of impact does it have on the diaspora, or in this case, the Caribbean people? Marcus Gavi said, look for me in the whirlwind. You know, look for me in the whirlwind. Because even though you think that I am laying down my body, I shall come again. You know, as a whirlwind, I shall come again amongst the masses of the people. And if in life I can fight for you with this amount of of, of passion and death, I will even be more of a warrior fighting towards your liberation. Um, I think beyond any kind of dispute, Marcus Gavi was one of the greatest sons that came out of the Caribbean, um, addressing holistically um, all the facets for our liberation as a people. Um, Marcus Garvey addressed the spiritual question, he addressed the economic question, he addressed the question of identity, and he addressed, like I said, the economic question. That was one of his platforms. And he done it through the, the, the word. Okay, so the, 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 the press, the press that he has, was able to develop, the word was able to spread throughout the Caribbean and even onto Africa. And um, we can see our brother Kwame Nkrumah, you know, having the Black Star. Um, the Black Star was, was, was the international symbol for the Marcus Garvey movement, red, black, and green. And Kwame Nkrumah was able to place that star within the, the flag, the national flag of independent Ghana. And so Marcus Garvey, in terms of culture, most of the early musicians, especially in the reggae genre, was the mass movement in America was through Marcus Garvey's movement, uh, UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, so Marcus Garvey has left a footprint at any organization, institution, or individuals who are truly interested in the liberation of the people, they have to look at that blueprint because that blueprint is still to be fulfilled. And we are the generations now to pick up that baton, you know, and to lift Marcus Garvey high. So as part of our own work here in Barbados and part of the Lion Soul family, soldiers, land family soldiers, Marcus Garvey is very prevalent in our music. So it, it keeps us centered, you know. Um, yeah, uh, especially when you look at Bob Marley or Burning Spear, those only still there's um, Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey, so. The, the blueprint has not yet been um, uh, 
put in practice. <laughs> you see, this is a man because I in this channel we do talk about him a lot because he's such a figure that cannot be ignored for any reason whatsoever. Uh -huh. He's so important both to African diaspora and even to the Africans in Africa. Yes. He's, he's such an important figure. At the time, he was able to mobilize the people, create a shipping line. That is something that even today, 2022, is difficult for a lot of Africans. A lot of millions of them put together, they cannot even do. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and he did it without the social internet. And yeah, yeah, please. Like <laughs> <laughs> Marcus Gavi was a genius. Uh, um, again, you asked me earlier on where I was born and stuff. But certain people are born towards this task, right? And, and they stand head and shoulders in terms of the, the vigor which they pursue the mandate. Because the mandate was given to them before they were even flesh. It was given to them in the spirit world. So once they find the alignment within their purpose while we are here on earth, once we find our alignment while here on earth as to what is our purpose, there is no stopping. So therefore, part of our spiritual, our revolution has to be our spiritual revolution, bringing back the integrity within those realms of things. And um, Marcus Gavi, like you said, uh, he was head and shoulders and... Um, you see, the truth of the matter is, even in the scriptures, it says many will be called, but few will be chosen. We today are confused with knowledge, Obehi. We are confused with knowledge, and we think knowledge validates our contribution to this struggle. Knowledge is only one arm, one branch of the total... Um, arsenal that we need to embrace. The scriptures again says, take the whole armor from the crown of your head to the, to the soles of your feet. Take the whole armor. So we have to infuse that knowledge with the integrity of our historical, spiritual, African customs. Right? And some of the leaders today, yes, they can voice about emancipation both for Africa and for the diaspora. And we can speak about a USA, a United States of Africa. But some of our leaders, the reality are reality is sorry, they are more stumbling blocks towards that realization than than than, than some of the common people. Because they have been seduced by the Western world. So now they are they be, they are more obstacles and we have to have some frank conversation amongst ourselves, you know, how we can bypass, circumvent, or even remove through democratic means or whatever means, you know, some of these leaders which will never bring up that kind of international solidarity that we need. And anyone within this present time we have to realize that China is only strong because China is a large land mass united under one government. Europe has their own combination of countries, India, Russia, or wherever it is. And we will always be disregarded, disrespected, disembodied. You know, I hope they just recently shot our brother, a young brother, 80 bullets. We will always be the doormat, you know, the, the trampling ground of other nations unless we have representation of power. Again, coming back to Marcus Gavi, he said, a nation without, a people without power is a people without respect. So we, at some point in time, we really and truly have to recognize. And instead of going after this dream about a whole total united Africa, we have to consolidate those who understand the mission and work with those groups like Kwame and Kuma, because I don't know if, you, but if you read the initial constitution of, of Ghana, 
it was never meant to be Ghana to follow the, the, the construct as an independent country alone. Because Kwame Nkrumah specifically said that the, the independence of Ghana is nothing outside of the independence of the whole of Africa. So we have to recognize that the, 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 the strength of unity brings about the power that is necessary to, 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 to stand head and shoulders with any nation. So unless we have that power, we will have the divide and rule. Some people will be more compensated by the Western forces that seek to keep us permanently divided. And other people will be martyred and assassination, assassinated. And the rest of us will be, with limited resources, will be left in the wilderness trying to create some kind of organization. But it is so difficult to have an organization outside of the resources, especially today when you have left, right, and center, international information. And when you have international information from the internet and the technology and you cannot respond, it really weakens you. But the strength about it is try to have integrity, even though among small groups, and then connecting those small groups into larger groups to try to make a definite, tangible contribution towards the liberation of your people. Thank you for that. That is very important. <laughs> people without power, they are going nowhere. They will not be respected. Um, it's not really that we are not many enough. It's not a question of, yeah, the number is very important. Even the space is important. But if you are not organized yourself, you don't have power, Nobody is, going to re <clears throat> Nobody is going to respect you. The reason uh, Israel will always be respected, even more than the whole of the African continent put together, <laughs> is because they have something they can put on the table where there is a debate. I, I really say, because when the war in Ukraine broke out, a lot of people were looking at it from different angles, but I say, look at the United States and Europe, the West, let's put it like that, who, were, uh, who usually would say in a situation like that, what they, will imp what they will impose is no fly zone. But why are they not able to uh, impose no fly zone in Ukraine? Imposing the no fly zone automatically means shooting down Russian flight. Uh, are you able to shoot that Russian flight without the, the collateral damage about that? They cannot do that, so they didn't impose a no fly zone. Which is to say that Russia is able to put something on the table to control the conversation. Hello. That is power. That is it. But what are we able to put on the on the table to negotiate with the European? We have the resources. They come with the printed dollars they, they printed on their backyard <laughs> yesterday. They give it to you. They take your resources and they go away. Hello. You can't do anything about it. <laughs> exactly so, my brother. It's absurd. Speak, speak your truth, man. They look at, for example, the way we organize the, the country that we have, the way we, we organize our military, in Africa, we don't produce weapons. We, we rely on our competitors in case there is a war in Africa. Which country does that in the world? Nobody except us. You must be able to defend yourself. You must be able to ready to defend yourself. If we don't do that, if we don't have power. So who is going to respect Africa? Nobody. At the United Nations, where they want to vote, in case of any really important things in the world, we don't we cannot start any chance okay i understand that from time to time they do give us um uh, uh secretary but what is secretary secretary what what do you do as a secretary do you what kind of power do you really have looking at the african diaspora today we are more than 500 million people in our soul in our mind where is marcus gavi i mean that spirit do you see it reflected in the life that we live? Because there are some movement here and there among African diaspora, many of them thinking of how to um, how to contribute to Africa. But do they have that mindset that Marcus Garvey was talking about? That's a question of the time. <laughs> That's a question of the time. That's the million dollar question. Um, like I said, uh, we don't, those of us who are progressive, 
we don't have the resources in terms of the financial resources. But our resource, the most important resource we must have is integrity. Integrity has to become our currency. So I can call you and say, I need this done. And without money, we try to make sure that it is done. If there is money, yes. But money cannot be the determining factor in what is done amongst us. So if we can, again, I cannot emphasize the importance of having a network. The same thing like uh, Harriet Tubman, you have an underground network, the underground real world. Today, we don't necessarily have to be underground, but in some matters, obviously, we still have to be underground because no one never lets anyone know exactly what they are thinking, what they will be planning. But on, on the service, we have to have a network of organizations and institutions that can get things done. Just now you were speaking about the no-fly zone. Gaddafi in Africa was about to bring about the second revolution. The first revolution was about our political independence. But when we understand the economic independence and of a United States of Africa with our own finance, our own gold, like you said, it is ups. <laughs> oh, man. For someone to bring paper dollar and take away your gold, to take away your diamonds, <laughs> to take away your coal tan for a piece of paper that has no value. But when we remove those people, artificial currencies of trade, and we replace them with something of substance, then we become a danger to the whole economic structure. So it was necessary for them to take out Gaddafi under whatever pretenses. And most African leaders, if we see historically, from the time they start speaking about replacing the dollar, regardless if it's the French or the English or the American, Europe, they becomes an international threat. But we have to, and this right now, this conversation is very, very deep and obeying. Um, the sad truth about this is that there are not many African heads of state who are willing to embark upon that revolutionary journey. They have the resources, they have the, the, the word sound, the voice, but in terms of bringing about that kind of total revolution to replace this archaic capitalist system that could never be a model for our development. It can never be. We have to replace it. But who is really willing to go the 10 miles to, to make sure that it is done? So therefore, we have to seek and find if there are few African leaders who are genuinely interested and the system with them so that internationally we have an organization just as the Marcus Garvey was, was putting forward. We have to, like I said, work in a very conscious manner in identifying because every soldier has a footprint a historical roadmap that he or she, they, or as an institution has traveled. And it is that footprint we have to look at in terms of forming the necessary structure, global structure for the advancement of Africans. And that to me is, 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 is the only um, hope we, yes, in our individual spaces, we have to continue working, planning, organization, and giving the people tangible substances. Because sometimes we become too intellectual. And, we, and if we become too intellectual, then the people cannot see how the, the, the dread of their day-to-day -day lives will be improved by Pan-Africanism. So Pan-Africanism has to transfer tangible goods 
as to how nurseries, schools, employment, a new socialization, whatever it is that we have to be able to transfer onto the people so the people can see the benefits to their lives. On the ground level, on the national level, but on the international level, then we work to, towards forming that international structure of, of representation of power, of economics, politics, and defense. Before I did say that we we're going to talk about the relationship, but it is very important. Um, so I want you to speak to what kind of relationship do we have today between the African diaspora and the Africa at home? Barbados within the Caribbean is very progressive. We have a very progressive Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, and she is building ties South to South relationship. She has been very instrumental in um, the first South to South Heads of State um, conference. It was held at the last year or year before, and they have pledged to repeat it every year, whereby embassies, businesses, cultural exchanges will be a part, will be more part of our everyday lives. Um, in terms of a structured program for reconnecting the South, the nations of the South. So hence, the Caribbean will be having more trade, economic, cultural relationships with Africa. We have opened up um, three embassies, I think it is, in Ghana and, and, and two other places, which I can't remember often right now. But that is part of the government to government we on the ground now, we have to keep lighting the fire because the government will not do things except the people are pushing them to do the things, especially things that might not seem to be too traditional and too right or breaking from the colonial area. So we on the ground, we have to efficiently organize so that we become a force to be recognized and to be um, negotiated with in order to ensure that the roadmap that has been set by the state is continued and continued not only to, to improve the financial standards of the larger companies, but also to improve the regular everyday lives of the people on the ground. And this is very important in establishing trade, etc. We have to be mindful that we are not opening up Africa to be exploited by a petty bourgeois or a bourgeois class of people. Because then we are just reinventing the Berlin Conference in, under the disguise of South-to-South -South trade and relationship. We have to ensure that the people on the ground level are the ones who are, who are mostly being um, elevated through contacts and through the improvements of their lives within that. So we on the ground uh, in Ghana this year, 2022, there will be a conference on Marcus Gavi on culminating on the 17th. So brethren from Jamaica and Canada and United States within the diaspora will be making a contribution towards that conference on the 17th of August. In um, Jamaica, there will be a lot of um, celebrations around Marcus Gavi's birthday as well. So we were initially trying to do a direct flight because, as you know, without direct flight, the, the communications and the trade and the movementation and the urgency of ideas manifesting into realistic programs without a direct flight, it, it has greatly, 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 greatly happened. Uh, we do not need to go to the States or to Europe <laughs> to go to Mama Africa <laughs> when if we fly directly, it is eight hours from the Caribbean or, or six or seven, depends on where you're going from. So those, a memorandum of understanding has just been established between Ghana and Barbados, exploring direct flights. So these are the things that is on the table. But like I said, uh, my brother, we on the ground, on the grassroots level, have to keep lighting the fire so that the integrity of the vision remains as true as possible. Now, someone says the art of politics is compromised. 
<laughs> so you have to learn to work with, with those that have a progressive program. Any colonial country coming out of that, that, that kind of um, repression, oppression, will have faults in terms of the kind of relationships that we establish. So that is part and parcel. We have to understand that there will cannot be any perfect. But at the same time, we have to look and see what are the gems in this trust? What are the gems that we can identify and, and, and transform and refine until we can get something tangible? And then, like you said, you know, Marcus Garvey, Black Star Liner coming into Africa. So those are the dreams that are reinventing itself through integrity, through integrity. And we have to be mature enough to sit down and say when we are right or when we are wrong without being subjected, you know, because, you know, we are masters in terms of breaking up everything. Somebody don't agree, break up, down, la, 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 la. No, no, no. We have to be more mature and understand that criticism and self-criticism has to be part of the journey, you know, regardless of what you want to call it. You know, so that is that is how I am seeing what is going on. And before I, I move off the subject, in Barbados, there will be an international conference on reparations in Barbados um, for the early part of August. So we are doing our part and representatives from the global African community will be coming into Barbados to continue the conversation as to strategizing as to what is the program to take us forward. The proposal to have a direct flight between Barbados to Ghana is something that is highly welcome, something very important Yes. Uh, that it must be encouraged. It needs to happen. In fact, more like that needs to happen. Yep. Uh, that is the, the collaboration and the connection that we are talking about. Uh, you see, the other day I was um, interviewing uh, uh, a lecturer, a scholar here, then I was saying, Many people say they don't know African enough. Even many African diaspora do say the same, no? that they need to learn about Africa from other people. But I was saying, why, but why do we need to do that? Because we are living in the 21st century. This is 2022. There is connection. There is a po if you want to go to Africa, it takes you maybe like about uh, a couple of hours. You are in Africa, no? You don't really rely. You don't need to rely on somebody to teach you about Africa. You can go there. These people, they are still, they are still here. The language is still the same. So we can. We don't really have anything that is inhibiting us from connecting and collaborating. So initiatives like this must be encouraged. But that leads me to another thing, a kind of a curiosity that I have, which is the borders that we have in Africa in relation to. Uh, the idea of pan-Africanism. I wanted to speak to that. Earlier on, I mentioned Kwame and Krumah. Because, again, if we look back past from the conversation we just had, his mandate was to have a united Africa. But the African leaders at the time couldn't understand that vision, or they understood it very well, and realize that their own self-interest will not be served if they become a united Africa. Because being educated, socialized with a Western organ education, a Western socialization, it, 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 even though you are a black human being, as Franz Fanon said, you know, black skin but white mask, what is the psychological you know, impediments that we take on as our persona, that even though we are within our people, we are the greatest obstacle to their progress. So even within Marcus Gavitani, <laughs> within the United States, he had to fight some of the most learned people, black-skinned people, about the same whole concept about a united Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, within the African conference, some say that the gradualism and all this kind of folly within the Caribbean, the Caribbean is divided the same way. So it has to be recognized as 
a master plan by the former colonial powers to keep us permanently divided by seducing leaders with privilege and power, money and whatever else they want to associate with it, so that they will seek after their own interests under the disguise of the people's interests or towards a, a racial policy program for upliftment. So that is why I keep coming back to the, the question of integrity. Because all these artificial boundaries of sovereignty had only one purpose, keep the people divided so that we can moving our military, we can moving our financial systems and structures, which will always keep them impoverished, you know, like the, <laughs> the French plan that even though they were independent, they still have to keep their foreign reserve in the French um, bank. Um, all these set of madness, you know, um, colonies, countries today still being colonies of France, um, the question of Haiti. Uh, so the, the world today is an undoubtedly designed for the perpetuation of white superiority. White superiority at times uh, transcended by power and money. So some of the other races <laughs> that are not white, they, are, they can still join the club based upon the billions of dollars that they have ripped from their country legally. So that is, that, that is another subject, but I'm saying today, what we are facing is the continuation of the colonial plan, um, regardless if they call it that way or not. So we have to find leaders who are committed to that new vision of Africa. We have to find the resources to protect those leaders because we understand that when those leaders make manifest their character assassination, personally assassinated, coups, poison, all set up. Every time we rise, our leadership rise, it becomes a threat to the international order. We, our journey is to change that, so we have to be very mi mindful of what are the forces that we are fighting and organize accordingly. We have to organize spiritually so we can have foresight of certain things before they happen. We have to organize economically, politically, socially, culturally. So that is the journey, my brother. Um, some of these African leaders, they are holding on because it is their interest. It is their self-interest that they are serving under the disguise of democracy, human rights, and free. <laughs> Oh my, <laughs> all the while the people are suffering. Yeah. I am thinking, did we make a mistake during the independence? Are we really free? Do we really have independence? Or we are just having people, you know, during the colonial time, the Europeans didn't really see Africa as a country that needed to be administered separately. They look, I usually make this example, they look, they look at it like satellite campuses. Uh, satellite campuses are not really the campuses are not really independent. They are responding to the main university. In this case, the real university is the one which, in this case, might be the European economy. And the independent, because the independence was on contract, it was written. This status quo was, was to continue. So, to those people that are stealing money from Africa, they don't really look at it that they are stealing money. They are just playing the old game. So. Where did we make this mistake? Colonialism, imperialism, that is the operation mandate. That is the MO. Um, they will not depart. And we have to understand that these people sat down and developed scientifically Song, 
strategic methods to control. You mentioned Nigeria and the different ethnic language representations. But Nigeria had an existence long before colonialism. And the people existed with one another. <laughs> the people had civilizations that lasted longer than the European present day situations. Civilizations, sorry. So therefore, it is that history that we have to look upon. What footprint that our elders, because we as a people, we did not begin with slavery. We didn't begin with colonialism and the ravaging of our resources. We did not begin with the transplantation of human beings. Because many a time they want us to start looking at ourselves from that page. But if we can go back and see what are the contributions that we gave in terms of governance, uh, in terms of society arrangements, you know, human relationships, ancestral um, connections to the community and responsibilities. Those are the precious roadmaps that we have to look at in order to, to replace, because we have to replace the present system with what? Are we going to reinvent something or are we going to look at the treasures that have been given to us by past civilizations? And I have first-hand experience in speaking to some of the traditional chiefs on the limited time. And I know that there is a conflict between the traditional values that are upheld by some of the chiefs and those that are upheld by the present-day political leaders. Because the political leaders realizing that the more that they can um, diffuse the, the integrity of the traditional um, way of governance is the more that they can appropriate personal wealth. Right? So we have to we have to get our scholars and, and our intellectuals and those who understand the makeup of society, uh, those, those very important um, nation building tools, we have to get our, in, our, our, our international intellectual class, those who have shown themselves to have integrity, to begin fashioning, fashioning those, 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 that blueprint you know, as to what we'll be replacing this present um, Western-oriented societies with that promotes human value, the sacredness of life. Those, those genuine virtues that we have to replace our present society with. And, and it, it is a tremendous fight, but we have no other choice. We have no other choice. Um, the technology is obviously replacing whatever virtues we had of our own sense of moralities. You know, the West is literally imposing itself on the minds of our children, even though our children has not migrated. You know, the technology now is in their faces, so they are they are possessing values and, and moralities that, that are so in conflict with the sacredness of life, with a new vision for a new society that we really have to identify those things and try and, and have something that is meaningful and that can be embraced by the younger generation, the, 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 the older generation as we have identified, some of them will want to come towards the new vision for Africa. And those that are stumbling blocks, we'll have to find a way to, to, to replace them. Thank you so much for that. And now, I want you to spend some time on, on your music, because that is very important. Uh, because now, you're touching an area that is very important, which is about culture, our value system. 
I'm not going to really spend time there because that would take away the time we are going to spend on music. But really, I'll be interviewing different people in Africa related to this about our value system. And all across Africa, it is a fully value system. Yep. And it's gradually be replaced by strange idea. Yep. That is why I think artists, this time, their work is particularly important. Particularly important. Because we are looking at the reinterpretation of our history, our culture, our value. So tell me, what is the role of music in all this that we are talking about? When we, when we analyze it, is that we are producing, we are the ones who are producing, but what we are producing is a, a deliberate form of mindlessness. There is no, and I'm not being vicious by saying that, but there is no other people who has internalized and have exported rhythm, music, movement, culture as Africans. The world understands that. So they have taken our strength and cause us to produce base, mindless culture that is very infectious. When you see the contributions of the black Americans, who how, how could you not, you know, want to be part of it? But at the same time, what it is that they are projecting from our own power, our own culture, so our own culture is now being used to continue the, the violence, and I use violence in a very broad way, the emotional and the intellectual and the human relationships and the poverty, all that is violence. And when you look at black American culture, which is the dominant force in world music today, it is mindlessness. And it is very, very deliberate. These people who control the mass media in terms of cultural um, products and, and, and packaging and, and penetration of, of, of other societies. It is very, very deliberate. Because again, if you feed people with that kind of culture at the end of the day, what it is that you have? Men disrespecting beautiful women and sisters. You know, there is no sense of building of intergenerational wealth. There is no sense of reflection of what is this life that we are really living, purpose of this life, you know. So when you add those things together, we, in the pursuit of our strengths, that has been masqueraded and disguises as this kind of mindlessness culture, uh, we are doing more disservice and perpetuating our own enslavement by embodying that kind of culture. Now, one of our greatest ambassadors of culture from the Caribbean was Bob Marley. Bob Marley has been able to merge consciousness, relevance, and sweetness. So he has transcended the Caribbean. He's an international figure. Now, many a times we speak about best practices and finding best practices and replicating best practices. So why then, my brother, if Bob Marley is, was the most successful of all the Caribbean artists in pushing forward this genre of a, a new society, of a new hope, why are we not encouraging and using that as our major plank in terms of bringing forward new artists on the world market today. So these things, when you sit and you study them, these are, we are allowing commerce to dictate our cultural realities. And commerce is about the bottom line profits. And if commerce and profits are from a capitalistic mindset, we as African people will always feel the pain 
of, our, of, of the folly that has been inflicted upon us through, again, our strength as culture. So we definitely need to sit and we, you know, we, we examine what is being done to us with culture. And it is, is a, is, is a, I don't know if you ever try talking to a drunk man, you know, but when you become drunk with the wine of Babylon, you know, you have to use a different kind of language. Sometimes you have to use the same language of wine to get people out of a state of drunkenness. So we know the artists here, my music, my music is deliberately centered around even deliberately centered around the Bob Marley model, consciousness, relevance, and sweetness. So regardless of what we sing or what we do, you'll never find us in any kind of slackness in demoralizing our women or not just spending money on on bling and, and clothing and hairstyles and nails and all these kind of falsities that have nothing to do with our human beauty, you know. So we try to push that model. Uh, we understand that we have to work with our brethren and sisters as a family, but the light, um, without compromising, we have to be the light to shine. Uh, if we be a voice in the wilderness, it is our intentions not to be a voice in the wilderness forever. We understand the enormity of, of the resources that are extended to productions and on an international basis. Um, but that is what we have to work with, you know, until we can do better. So the light, if we are following that trend of, you know, uh, one of our great sisters said, uh, do your best until you can do better. Um, that is the journey that we are traveling on right now. We are doing our best in terms of shining the light um, until we can do better. Uh, because it is tied up within the, the whole struggle, the whole revolution, the whole reclaiming of our humanity as beautiful souls, you know, that walk in this present time. You see, um, I think that was in 1987. That was when Thomas Sankara was assassinated. The then president of Burkina Faso. Yep. Now, there are a few things that uh, a lot of people remember him for. And I want to make uh, point out one today, which is that as Africans, we should produce what we eat and eat what we produce. Mm -hmm. Now, let's bring that to music. What if we were to sing the kind of music we want to listen to? Of course, I'm not saying that we shouldn't produce music or that other people want to listen to. But if the kind of music I'm singing now degrade my people, I should be stupid to be doing that. So I want you to speak to that. If we were to produce the kind of music we really want to produce to protect our image, to glorify who we are, what kind of music are we supposed to sing? You know, one of the statements that Marcus Garvey said was Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. One of the statements that Robert Mugabe, the late of um, Zimbabwe, he said, <laughs> they did not negotiate when they took our lands. Why should we now have to negotiate to take them back? If we as artists could look and scope around Thomas Sakara, you know, this, our same brother Julius Nayeri, our brother from Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, all these greats, and see Bob Mali made internationally famous until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another race inferior is permanently discredited and abandoned. That became an international anthem, my brother. So the material is there, but it's the resources and it is the the, the orientation to let our artists understand this is what is needed in order for us as a people to reclaim our humanity. Because 
a politician can get up there and make a statement, blah, 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 blah. People forget it in no time. An artist make a song, it keeps in your head over and over. So music is the most powerful medium for change. That's why they're doing that to us, by feeding us so much isms and schisms that is of no benefit to our development. So we have to try and know to try and find artists, give them the necessary resources and rewards for them to do nation building, racial building, songs and movies and poetries and dances and architecture and churches and politics and all these things can as one holistic movement, ecosystem of development. That is, that is the new Africa. And, and it cannot be done without the artists making their contribution. That means that, that we actually have power. We have. We just have to learn how to understand that we, we are the power base, you know, and that is where influencers like yourself, you know, have to, regardless of the obstacles that may come, some days you find, you might think that I am not doing anything or I'm not doing enough or I don't have this resource, or I don't have the finances. And every one of us going to this slum of, 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 you know, we think that we are failing. So we get trapped into the darkness of, of, of disillusionment. No, we have to have friends, brothers, sisters, music. So when we enter, we can quickly pull ourselves up and keep fighting the fight. So I salute you, my brother, for the great works you're doing. I salute all the other artists out there, all the other institutions, organizations, grassroots levels who understand, yes, we are more often than not voices in the wilderness, but the men who have created the most, the men and women, my apologies, who have created the most amount of change uh, internationally, globally, and historically, at some point in time, they too were voices in the wilderness crying out until the light of what they be, were saying became manifest. Yeah, so keep pushing forward. You know, victory, as our brother Gabi say, is more than certain. You know, outside of that, what is the purpose to life? So then let us rise and let obstacles give us wings that we may soar above any mountains of challenge. For people that want to connect with you, they want to know more about uh, what you do within the area of uh, music and how to patronize you, why not? You deserve to be patronized for what you're doing. Tell them how to reach you. Use these few seconds to promote yourself. Well, you can go on the Instagram, the Lion Family Soldiers, S-O-U-L-D-I-E-R-S, -E and um, that will take you, give you some information as to what we are doing, um, we are building the pages um, and just keep following through and you will be getting information from time to time whereby we can build a family of people who are interested in making a difference through music and through any other activity that we are engaged in. You know, positive all the time, positive all the time, positive all the time. All right. Now, what would be your final thought here in the conversation that we have had today? about African, African diaspora, music. Okay, uh, please give it a kind of conclusion in your way. We had a conference here for the decade for people of African descent. And in the opening, I was asked to give a short few words. And I said, Africa's salvation is humanity's salvation. Africans at home and abroad, we are too great. We have made too great a contribution. And when global humanity recognizes that contribution, they realize that this is indeed humanity's salvation. But in order for other people to recognize we first have to have that conviction that we are the foundation of civilization. Our contributions are far and great. Like I said, spiritually, politically, economically, 
education, culturology, through all the social media. We are a great people and we have to bring back the balance to humanity because right now humanity is off whack. We have to bring back that humanity. We have paid the price, so we deserve to be able to hear our voices loud ringing on the mountaintop, as Martin Luther King said, ringing, ringing, ringing on the mountaintop. You know, and we have the foundations from the lessons and teachings that our great, great leaders and great, great civilization has given us. So let us hold fast. Let us hold fast to those teachings. Yeah. And rise. Rise up. Rise. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. This has really been very interesting. Thank you so much. Sir. I appreciate it. Blessings, my brother, to you and your Thank family. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead Podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you in the next episode.